I'm Glenn Peoples. Well, the Apologetics Canada conference has just now ramped up in Abbotsford, British Columbia. I have to say, I wish that I could have been there, and I'm somewhat envious of my fellow contributor to Rethinking Hell, Chris Date, who was there. Now, in the Q&A session following his keynote address on the first evening of the conference, one of the speakers, William Lane Craig, a Christian thinker I can't help but have a huge amount of admiration for, like many people do, made some comments on hell that deserve to be highlighted just because they really exemplify the way that even very sharp-minded evangelicals can go wrong on this subject. He was asked whether or not hell, presumably conceived by the person who posed the question as consisting of everlasting unhappiness or torment of some kind, was compatible with the goodness of God. Now here's the question as it was put to Bill along with the first part of the answer. There, there have been a number of questions about hell. So could you um, explain to us what hell is and whether a good God is compatible with the hell? I don't think that hell is what is depicted in medieval paintings of torture racks and pinchers and red hot irons and things of that sort. It seems to me that the essence of hell is what Paul describes in 1 Thessalonians 1 5, where he says, They shall suffer the punishment of exclusion from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. And I think that is the anguish of hell, this separation from God, from all that is good and beautiful and, and lovely, uh, to be left with one's own crabbed and selfish heart forever. Um, and I think that is the essence of what hell is. It has become common for evangelicals who believe what they see as the traditional Christian view of hell to increasingly shy away from visions of a horrendous torture chamber in the bowels of the earth, which is good because that portrait of divine justice is patently unbiblical. But they really haven't let go of what was wrong with that vision, namely an eternal life of misery rather than a more biblical picture of final death or destruction. What they now stress is that hell is an endless life of conscious misery separated from God. So strongly do some evangelicals think that this is actually a biblical view that, and I'm sure without intending to, when they think they are recalling passages of scripture that speak about this subject, what they're actually recalling is simply their own understanding of the doctrine of hell and not a passage of scripture at all. In fact, St. Paul never said that anyone would suffer the punishment of everlasting exclusion or exclusion from the presence of the Lord. What St. Paul claimed is that those who reject the gospel will be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And in spite of the NIV's extra words, which any of the more literal versions don't have, there's no reference to the lost then being shut out, as though they're still hanging around. As the ESV translators point out in the footnotes, there are two things that this could mean. Maybe it means that people will be destroyed from the Lord's presence in the way that we might talk about a ship in battle being blown from the water. Or it could be a statement that the destruction itself comes from the presence of the Lord, which is the same way that Nadab and Abihu were punished with fiery destruction that came from the presence of the Lord in Leviticus 10. Whichever of these two translations is correct, the predominant idea is destruction. I haven't been able to find any translation that translates this verse the way that Bill quotes it, namely by saying exclusion instead of destruction. If the idea of exclusion is here at all, that exclusion comes about simply because the enemies of God have been destroyed, and so of course they're not included in God's presence. The reality is that scripture nowhere speaks about hell or divine judgment as something that locks them up somewhere to be miserable with their bad self. Instead, the overwhelming trend in scripture when describing the fate of the lost is to say that they will die, they will be cut off, they will perish, they will be destroyed, and so on. Now, Bill then went on to make the good point that 
in fact, the goodness of God really requires that he do something about sin. Although he never actually told us why that thing has to involve eternal misery. If there's a problem of why a good or loving God would send people to hell, Bill said, then there is a similar problem about why a just God would let people go to heaven. A point well made, as follows. Hell is a manifestation of the perfect justice of God. Um, and when you think about that, it is just as difficult a question as how could a loving God send people to hell to ask, how could an all just God send people to heaven? As a purely intellectual question, that is every bit as difficult. How could a God, a God who is perfect justice send anybody to heaven? And yet people never worry about that, do they? They never ask about that question. Good point. So what is the answer to this problem of heaven? If justice requires that God respond appropriately to sin, how could it be that he lets anyone into heaven? Or to use biblical language, why would he grant anyone eternal life? Here too, I think Bill is right on the money. The answer is Jesus and the saving work that he did by way of the cross. Listen to how he puts it. And I think the answer is Jesus. At the cross of Christ, the, the, the justice and the love of God meet. They meet at the cross. At the cross, we see God's justice as his wrath is poured out upon sin and Christ bears the penalty for sin that we deserve. But at the cross, we also see the love of God as God himself takes on human flesh and bears the death penalty for sin that his own justice had, enacted, had exacted so that we should never have to be punished and can go free. So at the cross we see the unfathomable love of God for us in what Christ suffered and endured for us, and yet we see the perfect holiness and justice of God as the terrible punishment for sin is poured out. I want you to stop for a moment and just think hard about a couple of things that have come up. In the initial part of his answer, Bill explained that in essence, hell is to be excluded from God's presence, to be left alone with our own selfishness forever. That's the punishment for sin, to be left with our bad selves. That's what God has to do to us because of justice, Bill believes. But now listen, when he's talking about the atoning work of Jesus on the cross, he reverts to saying instead that Jesus died the death that we deserve on the cross. He took, he says, the death penalty. Death penalty. He says that God's justice can be satisfied because what would have happened to us happened to Jesus so that we can go free. Is that really what Bill, and, and not just Bill, I'm not picking on Bill, is that really what most evangelical believers in the doctrine of eternal torment actually accept? Does he really think that Jesus was left alone with his own sinfulness and selfishness forever? Clearly not, as his frequent discussions on the resurrection of Jesus show. And so Dr. Craig has put himself in a real logical bind here. If hell eternal, conscious, miserable separation from God is the punishment for sin that God's justice demands, then he cannot turn around and answer the question of why a just God lets anyone into heaven by saying that in dying on the cross, Jesus has satisfied God's justice by standing in our place and dying the death that we deserve. That's not what he believes. If Bill is right about what the punishment for sin is, then Jesus did no such thing, even by Bill's own standard. Now, of course, Bill's not alone. Many, many evangelicals are in this same logical bind. Fortunately, there is a biblical way out. Yes, hell in the sense of the final judgment and punishment might be necessary because of justice. But if we take on board the Bible's teaching that the ultimate consequences of sin, as Paul told the Thessalonians and Jesus told the people numerous times, 
is death, then we can say that Jesus stood in and took the place of sinners on the cross. Because that's exactly what Jesus did. He died for sinners. Think about how much better we can answer this question that was put to Bill if we offer a biblical answer. Why would a good God send people to hell? Well, firstly, you have to understand what hell is. You need to hear what scripture says about hell in the first place. It's not eternal torment, misery, call it what you like. Hell is the consequence of rejecting God, who is the source of our life and our very being. Rejecting God is like cutting ourselves off at the roots. We die, as scripture makes so clear so many times. But God shows us his love through the cross, where his own son truly did take that penalty upon himself. Because instead of us dying finally and losing eternal life, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Does that sound familiar? So when you get hell right from a biblical perspective, the rest of the biblical gospel makes so much sense and those questions are so much more straightforward to answer. Maybe you should rethink hell. I'm Glenn Peebles.